Just just start your One, two, slideshow. Three. Yeah, it's, you won't hear it. Oh, okay. And, uh, we'll hit play on the... Oh, it's just in, in the web browser. Okay. Yeah. Oh, okay, so there's no... Yeah, just making sure. Awesome. I think you're good to go. going to be pulling me down. Okay, I guess I'm going to get started here. Yeah, sorry for a bit the technical delays. Um, so this session is going to be about uh, creating a Drupal A theme um, using all these wonderful technologies. It's, it's kind of a mouthful, but uh, it's, it's going to be somewhat of uh, a repetition of some of the stuff that ran yesterday in terms of uh, the new features of uh, the Drupal 8 theming layer. Uh, but I still wanted to go over that. Um, I don't know how many of you like have attended sessions yesterday there's a um, I think there's like a theming session from the fundamentals of Drupal 8 theming and there's a KSS session today too which is I'm gonna touch upon that stuff as well um, like by show of hands like to uh, mess with Drupal 8 already like in on the theming layer yeah like uh, in terms of uh, like the gulp and node stuff. Uh, anybody is using it at this point? Okay, cool. Uh, okay, so a little bit of background about myself. Uh, I'm a front end developer with AppNovation. Um, I guess I should say front end developer slash designer. I'm more of a designer background, so um, some of the stuff uh, that I'm going to talk about is in a way it's kind of beyond me because you know it gets technical really quickly but anyway AppNovation is um, a globally distributed company we are I think around 120 people at this point um, headquarters is, is in Vancouver we have an office I think about 30 people in Montreal which is from what I hear where the next uh, Drupal North is going to be hosted um, and then a few places in the States, in Europe. Uh, we are a sponsor here as well, and we do contribute to um, uh, uh, Drupal 8 Accelerate program to kind of help out with, you know, getting that release um, as soon as we can, I guess. Um, so, yeah, as I said, it's going to be like a twofold thing. I'm going to just run over some of the, we're kind of already late, I guess, uh, with the technical stuff. So I'm going to run over the, the new features for the Drupal 8 um, uh, in terms of like what theming stuff has been changed um, or like completely new to Drupal 8. And then we're going to go over the, the node gulp setup. Um, so this is all based on my sort of experimentation or just proof of concept, just wanted to spin out a theme with Drupal 8, started maybe like half a year ago. Uh, and at the same time, there's all these uh, tools and uh, in the front end world that are uh, like little toys, shiny toys that you want to grab and, and uh, start using, regardless if you need them or, or not. But it's just like so tempting to experiment with stuff and um, in, uh, try to in incorporate that into your workflow. So uh, you can see the demo for the theme. Um, I am briefly going to just show you. I, it's um, in terms of features, like it's. Uh, I was actually like when Drupal was beta six. I've set this up so it, it's, it has the libsass going, the sas partial structure. 
um, obviously it's responsive uh, um, and got some other um, stuff integrated into it so I got some animations going here and just like for the for the sake of uh, um, demo like can show you that like, we got that stuff going and we, we're going to talk about sort of integrating some of the GS stuff uh, uh, into this theme so um, I guess it will be relevant to what I just showed. Uh, the source code for this is on GitHub and it's also on Drupal.org as a sandbox project so you can check it out there, take it for a spin. Um, so as I said Drupal is getting closer to release date hopefully sometime this fall. Um, so it's nice to be kind of an early adopter and try to start using things to see how they work. Um, with that, I just wanted to go over the basic structure of a Drupal theme, and a lot of it is going to be very similar and familiar already for anybody who's doing theming stuff at this point uh, with Drupal 7. So, uh, as you'll probably already know, Drupal has switched to YAML for, like, um, like the, say, the, the info file, the libraries file that we have there, and uh, the stuff with the green text. I don't know if you can see uh, very well, but uh, in, in terms of those colors in there, but the green stuff is basically the three, three things. So, uh, uh, the theme itself is the... In, in my case, this theme is called Monoset, um, and it's the name of the theme uh, and that theme, which is your former template PHP file. Uh, so the info file is pretty straightforward. Again, you have to just be careful with the, the YAML format, like space-sensitive stuff, but it's pretty basic. You just declare key-value pairs and um, the name of the theme, type, description, all that stuff. Uh, the libraries um, is a new concept for Drupal 8, and it's basically a way for for themers to integrate, uh, or declare their dependencies. I mean, I mean, in terms of like their JS and CSS, adding their JS and CSS assets. So, uh, with um, just going to go over some of the ways how we can manipulate that. Um, adding the CSS and GS files um, in, into, into the theme. Uh, removing stuff from Drupal 8, like we're going to talk uh, in a second about Drupal 8 being more of a clean slate for, uh, for developers or like um, it's uh, not providing like default uh, mark up the core, it's not di dictating stuff to you by, um, you know, providing this, the, the classes and, and things like that, but um, at the same time there's still some stuff that's loaded. So in this case I'm just removing some stuff that I didn't want to use. Uh, the normalize uh, library, uh, I just have my own kind of reset in, 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 in the partials that I'm using, using SAS, so just remove that. and. You can remove anything that is served by core, and that's in your that info file. Uh, so again, it's a monoset that info that yaml, which is the name of my theme. Uh, defining a library, again, it's in that yaml file. Pretty straightforward. I'm just pointing to the uh, saying that this is a CSS file. It at, it's a themes uh, CSS file. It lives under. Uh, my styles directory, main CSS. That's where everything gets compiled. So, and this is called it globally because it's like uh, the style that I want it to be available across all the, you know, the whole site, all the pages. Same with the um, JS. So, um, declaring dependencies. Uh, as I said, so. Drupal has less assumptions now. Drupal 8 has less assumptions, so jQuery is not there by default, but you can uh, declare it as a dependency. So you just have to say that, you know, please stick it in there. So it, uh, it will um, 
once you declare it in your library, basically, like I'm dependent for in my main GS file for jQuery to be there. So I'm st uh, stating that in, in, in the library's file. Um, and there's a bunch of other things that are available in the, in if you want to see what comes with, with Drupal core, it's, uh, it's all under core assets. And there's a bunch of other things like backbone and modernizer, things like that. Um, giving, you know, weights or specifying a scope for your GS files is pretty easy. Also done in the libraries file. So here I'm just uh, kind of messing with the weight of where the, that CSS is going to be. Uh, obviously, it's it's more important for JavaScript. Like if I want to send it to the footer, I think still it's by default it, it's going to be um, in the header. Uh, most of the time, you would want it in the footer and probably your custom stuff you would want to be like in, in that specific place in the folder so uh, like specifying that scope and giving giving the weight is is pretty pretty easy again uh, in that libraries file uh, specifying the media type like I'm not using a print style sheet here but uh, pretty straightforward as well you just have to point it and give it the parameters of media print um, uh, this is a bit getting more interesting where you can specify a library and then only load that on a specific page or uh, specific content type uh, and this will this has to be done with a preprocess function uh, so and it's in in my monoset.theme file which is again your former template.php file uh, and I have defined um, a front page library which is only going to be loaded you know for those animations they're not like crazy heavy but still there's no point of loading them across the whole site so uh, just uh, serving those for the for the home page um, adding Google font too I mean there's a couple ways of doing that I think there's still a way uh, maybe now there's a way to that add that directly in the libraries file uh, I ended up doing just the, again a preprocess function in the in the uh, my want to set that theme file and let, let me actually show you oh I don't know how, how much of this you can see but so again just gonna go kind of to summarize again this is the the, the dot info uh, the that info that YAML file so again, name of the theme. Uh, I'm going to talk about this declaring uh, class as a base theme just in a second. So like all this is pretty straightforward. So those are the two libraries that I wanted across my site, global and vendor. And uh, these is where I am removing the stuff. Regions are pretty straightforward. Yeah, it's like a familiar concept from Drupal 7, right? So we still have those. In, in terms of the libraries file itself, you can see again this is my global library uh, print style sheet if I had one all the dependencies that I'm going to ask for from Drupal uh, my vendor library that I just referred again in, in here to and I want it I wanted that globally again so it's it's declared in that that info file will be available across the site so just a bunch of scripts that I've borrowed from other people for that like for the menu for animations and SVG injections just uh, prism is for code highlighting so some of the stuff that I've just utilized in this theme and then again this is the front page library that I wanted only available for those animations and uh, effects uh, so back to this so declaring class as a base theme, uh, again, as I said, so Drupal uh, comes pretty much as a clean slate, doesn't dictate you anymore as it used to, like the Drupal 7 doesn't dictate the markup or class names, things like that. Uh, much nicer to work with. I mean, f it's a big win for, from my perspective. Uh, on the other hand, if you want some sensible defaults, you want stuff, uh, already to be there you know some divs and some like BEMP style uh, CSS uh, class names and things like that you can declare classy as base theme and that will basically 
reroute everything through the Classy. Um, Classy has a collection of templates already, uh, you know, sitting in there. I mean, it's a core theme, and the, it's it's a core it's a core base theme for um, Bardic and uh, and Seven theme too. So um, that's that's the idea, I guess. So yeah, and just the. Uh, there is an effort, and uh, like again, there was a session yesterday by Scott Reeves about uh, twig stuff and uh, uh, removing all the pre-processed stuff from the Drupal theming layer. So it's removing that abstraction layer. I, again, for me, it's a it's a big win for Drupal 8. You basically like everything is now in, in template files. So for a themer, you know, especially from a designer background, like you know where the stuff is coming from. There's no, you know, trying to figure out <coughs> what it is, how it is. Like it's, it's just removing that abstraction uh, in terms of pre-processed process functions that run by, by Drupal. Um, one of the, the great debugging features for, for Drupal 8, this is actually in Drupal 7 as of maybe 7.3.2. I think too is that you you can enable well you don't have the services YAML file but you can enable the debugging feature where you you would see uh, like output of like where your templates are coming from in in the in I'll show you in a second um, in the source code in DOM basically you'll see the HTML comments and so with with a Drupal 8 install. Um, basically, when it installs, you have a service YAML, uh, services that YAML file, which you have to um, set the debug to true. Like I've actually set some of the other things uh, to true, <laughs> like uh, the auto reload and uh, cache to false, and created my settings that local that PHP. I think that actually stripped another kind of level of caching that Twig was trying to do, and for me it was um, kind of important because. Some of the the uh, the gulp stuff <laughs> running um, browser syncing and like watching for all the stuff that's happening with your templates kind of important for for it to happen instantly and uh, so that just removes that extra caching level. So yeah, go for it. From what I heard, caching is kind of broken Drupal eight right now. Yeah. So if they fix that, would you be changing this back? Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I can. T I'm totally maintaining this again. This is this is just on my local, right? So this is the so the services that YAML file is for anything on your local. You'll have that debug true, right? I'm just not sure that auto reload true. If you have to actually, you know, specifically say that you want that, and for cache falls, like most of the time, you'll end up with the settings local PHP file too on your local system. But none of this stuff is going to be. Uh, you know, it's not in my theme, right? So it's it's just in my in my install and sites default. Um, so that's the idea for like Drupal show showing you where once you have that debug enabled, and this in when you inspect your stuff, basically your your theme, you will have these HTML comments, and it's going to show you stuff is coming in core from core, or if I say it. Uh, say had Classy as my uh, uh, base theme, it would, you know, reroute everything through that. Look at the templates in there. So by looking at this, I can see what template is used, where it lives, grab that template, you know, decide how specific I want to be with that template, stick it into my, you know, copy, paste it, and start modifying, do whatever, you know, in terms of class names and things like that, and markup. Um, I can probably just show you really quick, oops, sorry here. So the idea, I don't know how much of this is going to be seen, but yeah, so all of the stuff in the green, which you can't really see. So go all of these comments, if you go down, like there's a bunch of there's a bunch of template files, basically that shows you where the stuff is coming from. Um, okay, so 
second part to this is the, the integration of this node based bell system with Lipsas and Gulp stuff. And as I showed earlier, like in that file directory, uh, there's some, th some things that are not specifically Drupal related. Again, it will be like the, the Gulp GS file. Uh, it will be the node modules um, uh, and package JSON file. Uh, again, this would not be necessarily Drupal 8 specific. You can run this on any setup like Drupal 7. I, I just, there's a, I think there's a catch with some of the stuff with Drupal 7 because uh, that info files, not that info, that YAML files, but Drupal 7 that info files kind of mess with the node modules because it contains some um, that info files as well. But um, Otherwise, yeah, this is kind of agnostic, I guess, <laughs> in a way. So in order to get this going, you have to have Node installed on your system. And it's, I don't know how many of you, again, like familiar with this. Like I've, I've previously, I've run the most of my stuff on, on Ruby, which is a pretty similar setup. So once you have the uh, Ruby installed on your system, you have a concept of jams, and you use Bundler to kind of declare all the dependencies that you want to uh, you know be uh, be using in in whatever process or tasks you're running so uh, node has its own installer you can either use that or if you like I'm using homebrew with homebrew it's pretty easy to install as well um, once you have the node going you have to install some packages like Node has the Node Package Manager, NPM, which installs some, some packages globally and some packages directly into your theme, or like where you tell it to, to install them. Uh, so Gulp is one of the things that has to be installed globally and also uh, like in, in, in a theme. Um, once you get that going, basically you CD into your themes directory and you do npm install it fetches all the dependencies uh, from the node repos wherever uh, and um, you after that you basically git ignore all the stuff because it, it's not uh, I mean it could get pretty heavy in terms of all the the stuff that you're gonna grab from node that each module uh, is gonna have some weight to it. Uh, so you get ignore it and it's for a next developer say or somebody like if it's like a project that you're sharing they're just gonna go through this install process once you once they um, download the, the theme. So the package JSON file uh, contains the basic information about uh, what this project is about it could be pretty minimal uh, again and then you just declare uh, all the dependent packages that you want to use I'm going we're going to go over those uh, in a sec and you can add more stuff to it if you feel like it again there's like plenty of uh, stuff in in, um, in the in the node in the node world there um, actually let me show you to the actual the actual oops. the actual directory for this. Oh, I don't know if I can zoom here. No, I can't really. It's hard to see here, but anyway, just that this is where all the node modules are. The Gulp GS file just sitting in that root directory, um, and the package JSON file. Does this kind of make sense so far? I don't know. Yeah? Yes, no, maybe. <laughs> OK. Um, I guess one of the things that, like if you're running uh, like a, a SaaS setup, and you probably are at this, at this point, most the people should at least uh, be doing SaaS. That's the point uh, of this whole thing. Um, like I've tried to uh, start uh, messing with uh, um, 
lip, lip sass, which is actually not really, uh, it's not anything different from your Ruby sass. It's just Ruby sass has started as a, as like, as a Ruby project from what I understand. But lip, lip sass is just a, uh, a port of same sass stuff, same uh, uh, library is just done in C++, I, I, I believe. And uh, it's been gaining uh, some momentum in terms of its like versioning. One of the disadvantages of using LibSAS versus RubySAS was that it was uh, the feature, uh, it wasn't as feature reach. So some features were behind. Like if you had to have something in your, uh, uh, in your SAS creation process or you run certain functions or things like it might have not been there at this point uh, uh, libsass is catching up and actually ruby sass is waiting for for the for those features for of libsass to kind of get on on pair on you know have the parity um, yeah one of one of the biggest advantages for of libsass from like what I hear and like it, this pretty much one, one of the first big things is that it's speed. So Ruby SAS, uh, not as noticeable on a project like this where you basically have a one pager site, you know, and you have few partials. Um, but on, on bigger projects where you have like a uh, massive CSS architecture, like I've heard people, you know, compiling times getting like, you know, a couple minutes long, which is pretty bad. Uh, so this is definitely not not the case with uh, LibSAS. So yeah, I, there's some comparisons, but I, I don't really uh, know the numbers exactly. But everybody's saying it's a lot faster. So in terms of feature, again back to feature compatibility, you can check out um, this uh, site, which basically compares all the SAS versions. You can see what's there for Ruby SAS versus LibSAS. And again, some of these are gonna be, like I'm, I haven't used like any of the crazy functions, math, math functions and things like that. Uh, so again, for me, it was pretty easy to adopt LibSAS because like in, in the beginning, I think like maybe six months ago, I was missing some, the mapping stuff was missing for SAS or something wasn't there. Uh, there's a couple other things that I was kind of missing. The breakpoint uh, gem, I don't know if you've heard of that. That's like it was kind of a thing that I've uh, adopted into my workflow, but uh, that wasn't there because again, it was Ruby dependent. But otherwise you can see now, like most of the stuff is, it's pretty close. So. Another point uh, is uh, the compass. Like many people have used that in the past, I've used it in the past, but I have kind of stopped using it. And uh, uh, compasses, uh, it's it's a Ruby. Uh, I guess it's a library, you should say, or it's like a just a, a bunch of mix-ins and different uh, things that utilities that you can utilize again in in your uh, SAS creation. Uh, I, I, as I said, like I've stopped using it and I haven't really been missing it that much. Uh, also, Compass is moving to being more agnostic or actually adopting the, the LibSAS as it's as of version 2.2 two, or like I, it's, I think it's at one something at this point. Um, but again, there are alternatives. Like if you're into using MXN, library, you can use Bourbon, you can use Neat for grids if you're into grid systems. You can also, um, I think you can use Suzy. I don't know if you've heard of Suzy grids, uh, just a grid system that um, I think now would, would, would can be set up with LibSAS, but it originally like it, it's coming from Ruby. Um, again, switching switching back to Ruby SAS with this setup is pretty easy too because I've declared all the packages through my through my package.json file, but I can I can switch up my my uh, instead of using libsas, I can say I want to use Ruby SAS and declare that as a dependency, and I'll be uh, running Ruby SAS instead. 
Did somebody ask him? Yeah. Bootstrap. Bootstrap. In like in 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 what uh, in what sense? Sorry. Yeah, like those are more like what you call semantic grids, like neat or or Susie grids. They're not like you don't have to have a specific markup in order to set up grids for your project, for your like layouts. With uh, Bootstrap, you have to have those those classes, you know, span seven, whatever. As far as I know, uh, like yeah. in in terms of utilizing. Uh, uh, bootstrap into this workflow. I, 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 I'm pretty sure you can do. You, maybe you, you, another thing that you'll require another dependency will be Bower. You would run through. You would run it through Bower, and because it's, it's just like another, another layer <laughs> added to this. For me, like again, I, I kind of wanted to keep things simple, so that's why it was like uh, getting rid of those extra dependencies, like dropping the Ruby stuff. Like why not uh, keep th things light? Uh, so uh, back to this gulp uh, stuff. Um, Gulpfile.js. Uh, it basically where you put all the tasks that you want to run, like repetitive tasks and some defining some pipelines uh, that are going to be run and some processes that are going to be run with your. Um, with your SAS and your like watching JS and, and images and Twig templates, compiling and doing and browser syncing. So that's where all the, all of that happens. Uh, again, so for me, the the most important thing is uh, like those three, I guess three or four things were uh, on the top there were the most important. So SAS compiling, obviously, uh, I wanted to have source maps. It basically shows me where my SAS is coming from, that partial um, that I want to target when I'm looking at the console, like I, I'm seeing the partial itself, not the style sheet where everything gets compiled. Uh, Auto Prefixer, uh, which is a great uh, plugin, and it's again available like in other formats, uh, like in terms of grunt and, and uh, things like that. Um, error notification without stopping the watch task. Uh, it's one of the things that I've set up in that gulp file. So when you run um, your process, you make a mistake in, in, in the creation of, um, you know, in, in just like forget a semicolon, uh, it's just gonna compl complain, pop up with a terminal notification. You can do some crazy things like, well, not necessarily crazy, but yeah, uh, more <laughs> edge case. I guess like you can uh, clean the Drupal, uh, clear the Drupal um, cache from from Gulp, a theme registry, and run like miscellaneous cleanup lint beautify tasks from from that Gulp file, and then browser syncing is just where everything gets uh, reloaded and synced up with your uh, the, uh, with your browser and other devices on your network, and actually. Let me show you so some of these. This is the the back to just kind of to kind of to summarize the stuff that I've talked about in in part. So this is the package JSON file. Just has some uh, basic information about what it is, and then I'm declaring all of these dependencies that I want to use on my theme. Oops, not this one. So, Gulp low plugins, just some helpers, and uh, Gulp auto prefixer notify, Gulp sus shell source maps, and things like that. So, yeah, as, as I said, later, there's plenty of things available out there. The actual Gulp file. So, it's basically like a JavaScript file. So I'm declaring some variables here on top that I want to use down the road, uh, like I'm specifying that, um, like I, I need the the gulp, uh, the gulp load plugin basically helps me with um, referring to uh, like all the dependencies that I'm going to call later with this dollar gl global dollar sign variable, 
and so I don't have to list all the note modules that I like to show you in in in, in, the, in that note module folder in here. So some error notification here, my main SAS task, which um, uh, you know watches uh, does the SAS processing, uh, does the source maps. Uh, like converts SAS to CSS, compiles things, and spits out any errors, does the outer prefixer, uh, and does the browser syncing. So that's, that's basically one task right there. That's like another task here for JS stuff. Like if I wanted to do some image optimization, I can run that uh, gulp images task. JS hint, like uh, you can do JS linting as well, uh, or beautifying. It kind of JS linting was was somewhat uh, uh, difficult to do because, like, I was using other stuff, uh, other uh, stuff from uh, other people's library, and I like I didn't want to clean that up uh, anyway. So. Uh, compresses GSS, you can compress, uncompress things. Uh, again, not exactly, you know, like Drupal's gonna do its own aggregation compressing anyway, so, but I kind of played with these tasks and kind of incorporated them there. Uh, running Drush, you can do Gulp Drush uh, and it will clear the theme registry as I showed, as I kind of talked about already. Um, browser syncing is where like my browser is going to watch for this um, uh, for this URL which is my local setup da.dev you obviously have to change that on your system depending what what's what what your local setup is and uh, so it's a proxy that watches for that and then my my default task is basically watching the um, SAS doing the browser syncing um, and compiling again and watching for changes in the uh, in the um, tweak files and I have because it takes a while to kind of set up everything I have just recorded some of the stuff in here I don't know if you will see a lot of this but show this anyway so I'm in my terminal, I'm already CD'd into my theme. Here I'm gonna run the gulp task. It's gonna fire up the browser, um, connect to browser sync. So I'm gonna open a inspector in here. So like I say, I want to uh, change one of the elements here, like that section. It's pointing me to the partial, uh, which is where it's coming from. So I have that partial open on the left. Uh, I can, I'm just gonna uncomment stuff in there. The gulp is gonna watch to see, get rid of the background in there. So um, comment that back, save that. Gulp is watching for stuff. It's kicking in the, the, uh, the reloading. Um, I'm gonna make a mistake there, see again, as forgot the semicolon when I was writing my SAS, so it's gonna complain there, it's gonna complain there, it's gonna make me go and uh, change that back, uh, or change, you know, add that semicolon. And it's not stopping the watch task, it's still going, so once I change that, everything is um, running. So this is a, a, um, a tweak template, so my, my page template, I'm just going to get rid of this whole section, um, delete that, or uncomment that, save that, so the gulp is, is running the task, so automatically get rid, gets rid of that first section. Comment that back, save it again, and adds it back in. <laughs> so that's just some of the default tasks that I've set up. Uh, I'm going to stop the gulp process and uh, do a specific gulp commands here. So gulp, uh, I'm doing gulp drush. 
So just because I have the notification going, I, it sh tells me that it's cleared the Drupal cache. Um, do gulp images. It's going to tell me that it has gone and compressed, blah, blah, blah. Since I've run it already, like the, no, no compression happening. Like some of these tasks, I don't want to be running every time on my watch task, but so I can run them. Just running JS hint, it just tells me that everything is okay. So that's that's the basic idea of, of this gulp and browser syncing watching tasks. Um, let me go back here. So browser sync again is uh, allows you to test your sites on multiple devices over a shared network by synchronizing URL interactions and code changes. Uh, so it's it's basically injecting stuff like CSS changes. It just uh, you know updates like as you saw it's it's pretty pretty instant uh, and again like the compiling stuff is pretty fast with libsas um, and it also not only watches for changes in CSS like it's all the interaction so like if you're checking out forms or like you, like your scroll events and things like that and it's going to watch it across your network so if you have other devices set up uh, for the for the browser sync. Uh, um, well, you don't have to set. You, once you set up the browser sync, it, like you can connect the same, oh, like a bunch of devices to the same network, and it's going to be updated everywhere. So, as of late, it has the UI, and UI basically is um, where. So my my local changes are happening on these local 3000 port. My my dev is actually da.dev, but I kind of actually like it because like, I am logged in here, and I'm not logged in here. So this is when I run the gulp watch task. It spits out this URL because, again, I've specified the da.dev as my the, the proxy. Uh, and the 3001 is the browser sync UI. So you can see, uh, like, it, t it tells me what... what uh, what port I'm on, like external, external URL, the proxy, and then there's some syncing options. You can, you know, synchronize all these click scroll events, inputs, and things like that. Uh, yeah, I haven't really like explored it this much myself. I guess you can mess around with throttling as well too. So, uh, you know, like imitate the network stuff, which is great for testing. Okay, so I think uh, just a word about this SAS partial structure uh, and architecture in, g in general. Uh, I, I kind of there's another way to kind of do uh, SAS globbing or bulk importing of all your CSS partials. For this one, I didn't really use anything, but I use this this tool called SAS director which uh, has a it actually has a sublime if you're using sublime it has a sublime plugin it actually also has a node package as well I haven't just incorporated that in, into workflow into my workflow but the idea basically that you have you have to declare all of these imports for your partial so these are given as an example so you would basically oops no, I want to be here just want to go back you stick them in here and it generates the if it does let's try this again yeah so it ge generates like a command line make directory stuff and uh, you know touch make all those files for you they're just a nice little tool um, So yeah, I think that kind of brings me to the end of this thing. So as I said, the source code is uh, on GitHub. The demo is there on uh, subtleship.net. Uh, and that's it. If you have, yeah, if you have any questions, I'm, I'll be glad to 
if I know the answers to answer them. Otherwise, GitHub again, my Zetagraph, and I have a couple blog posts about the same stuff on the AppNovation uh, website. Yeah. Any, any questions? Uh, actually, yeah. yeah? Um, have you got a good solution to clean off the uh, unused CSS classes throughout the whole site? No, I haven't. I haven't done that. I guess uh, again for me for this one, I kind of it's more. Uh, w this was more of a, I should say, like a crafted uh, project. So I kind of knew my structure, and it's like I I didn't want to use uh, stuff randomly or adapt stuff randomly, you know, from other libraries and things like that. Well, I guess I did in a way. Like I used that animate CSS stuff. Some of it is probably not going to be used, but otherwise, it's it's like I know what each of these partials is is doing and what 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 is in in, in this. But I'm pretty sure you can uh, there will be like a gulp plugin that you can incorporate into this workflow, and it will just automatic you know like will go and hunt those. Yeah. Uh, the, the assets don't get cached on the browser? I'm not sure. I don't know if I... Yeah, that's a good question. Yeah, that's a good question. I, I am not sure. I guess I don't know. Anybody? Like here? Yeah. Devel? Yeah, it's, yeah, actually I have, um, I just tried and uh, yesterday in the session, uh, so it was about uh, the twig stuff, uh, it was talked about briefly, but you, you have a Devel module and uh, for Drupal 8 already, or at least a, a dev version, you can install that, hopefully it doesn't break anything. <laughs> Uh, then af after you've installed that, you have this kin stuff. Whoop. Yeah, I guess you have to uncomment the whole thing. Anyway, so you can see this. Basically, you, you can go with, with kin and look at the other variables. So beyond uh, using that uh, uh, Drupal, Drupal 8 de debug features, you can ex you know, look into other variables that are available. So yeah. Yeah. Anything else? No? Um, oh, yeah? So, what do you, so I've got used to using breakpoints. Yeah. Is it, is it getting more than you think? What are you using? Yeah, so again, for, for this theme, and I, I've done this, uh, the actual design, like a layout for this for mobile, like six months ago. I think Lipsas was maybe at the time was missing maps. So the point is that it's it's actually pretty easy to set up a mix in that will do pretty, you know, uh, a th like it will do what Breakpoint is going to do. <coughs> and, but it's it's just going to be um, you'll uh, incorporate that into your like mix and like all your utility stuff. So uh, for this one too, I, I basically I do I do have that. Uh, so if I, um, I am using this kind of the same syntax uh, for, oh, let me find a file, or even here that I showed. So uh, add include breakpoint medium. And I think this, this is probably, so all this just refers to like a breakpoint that I've set up. All it took me to set this up is, is like 10 lines of uh, SAS in here. And I think you can do it differently now because you with lip SAS you can now use maps, SAS maps, not source maps. Yeah, it's different, yeah. But it's just like a key, it's like a key value and you define things and then you can refer to them later. So it's even like there's a cleaner setup. Um, but it's kind of same since obviously it's not going to be as robust as Breakpoint, but it, it does the basic stuff. So from a couple breakpoints that I needed.
day. I guess if there's no questions, I wrap it up. And thanks, guys. Thank you.